When Mexico's drug cartels forced Colombian traffickers out of the US co cocaine market, they seized control of the most coveted price in the global drug trade. But the smartest traffickers soon began to turn elsewhere, to a market where the profits were higher, the risks were lower, and the potential for growth was immense. They turned to Europe. Today, Europe is arguably the most attractive cocaine market in the world, and its size and importance only continues to grow. Over the last five years, the cocaine trade has enjoyed an unprecedented boom, with production levels at record highs. Coverage of this is largely focused on the United States and its seamlessly endless war on drugs. However, smarter traffickers have long preferred another market, Europe. For 2019 and the first months of 2020, the thinking was that the flow of drugs entering or passing through Europe was between 500 and 800 tonnes. We base these numbers in part on the notion that we are seizing 10 to 20% of the total, said one senior European police officer and cocaine expert, who was not authorised to speak on record. This number rivals the estimates of cocaine entering the US mainland. Consumption in Europe is lower than the United States, so it's likely that a significant percentage of the drugs entering Europe is in transit to other parts of the world. However, in many cases, European organised crime also profits from these shipments, and this trade is boosting criminal syndicates that pose a growing threat to European nations and the European Union. Since production began climbing in 2013, cocaine production has more than doubled, and whilst the rate of growth has slowed, there is still no sign of it hitting a peak. The world is awash in cocaine, yet prices have not collapsed as traffickers have aggressively explored and developed new markets. Here is where Europe has far more potential than the more saturated US market. Traffickers are pushing eastwards from the more established markets in Western Europe towards Russia and Asia and feeding every country in between. So while the US remains the natural market for the Mexican cartels, Colombian groups have increasingly focused on Europe as well as developing new markets in Asia and Australia. From a business perspective, trafficking cocaine to Europe is far more attractive prospect than targeting the United States. Prices are significantly higher and the risk of extradition and seizure of assets significantly lower. A kilo of cocaine in the United States is worth up to $28,000 wholesale. That same kilo is worth around $40,000 on average and as much as nearly 80000 in different parts of Europe. The United States has deployed massive resources in Latin America to fight the drug trade, with an army of drug enforcement administration agents, as well as work by other agencies like Homeland Security and US Immigration and Customs Enforcement and the US Military Southern Command. Europe, on the other hand, has but a handful of liaison officers posted to Latin America. Europe appears to lack a clear picture of the threats cocaine trafficking presents, which go well beyond public health issues. Europe does not suffer the levels of violence seen in Latin America, nor does it have the type of systematic corruption seen in many Latin America and Caribbean nations. As Europe battles COVID-19, an economic downturn, Islamic terrorism, internal political tensions and illegal immigration, the cocaine trade has slipped far down the list of government priorities. Yet Europe is not exempt from the collateral damage of the cocaine trade, nor the distorting effects of the economy that billions of euros of drug money produce as it washes through banks and local economies. There's drug-related violence in most European countries. Many examples of policemen, customs officials and port airport workers corrupted by drug trafficking organisations. And perhaps most worrying of all, the strengthening of European mafias thanks to the cocaine trade. The record flow of drugs is generating billions of euros for European criminal networks. The story of the rise of the Adrangheta in Italy is intimately linked to the cocaine trade, while the expansion of the power of the Balkan mafias is similarly linked to the cocaine trade. The national security threats presented by these criminal structures is clear and growing. The damage that the cocaine trade has inflicted in Latin America and Caribbean should also be a huge concern to Europe. The record levels of violence in the region, the growing levels of corruption, the undermining of democracy and the systematic abuses of human rights, all fed by the cocaine trade, should not be some distant concern. The collapse of Venezuela and the evolution of its increasingly dictatorial and criminalised regime means that European nations with a presence in the Caribbean now have a neighbour exporting cocaine and criminality as well as the exodus of migrants. Trafficking to Europe faces one inescapable hurdle. Unlike with the United States, there is no land bridge. 
Therefore, traffickers must move cocaine via sea or air. In the last decade, they have largely opted for the sea routes, focusing mainly on container trafficking. What has resulted has been an elaborate game of hide-and-seek, as traffickers use different methods of hiding cocaine among the millions of containers that reach Europe every year. Yet other ways of moving cocaine into Europe are bored. In November 2019, Spanish authorities seized the first drug submarine to be found in European waters. It had crossed the Atlantic with three tonnes of cocaine, which at the current European wholesale prices is worth up to $100 million. Well aware that European authorities are paying special attention to containers arriving directly from cocaine-producing nations of Colombia and Peru, traffickers are using other departure points around the region. Traffickers increasingly use rip-off, rip-on techniques, inserting drugs among legitimate goods with the owners unaware that their containers host cocaine consignments. While the main air routes for moving cocaine to Europe use commercial flights, there have been cases of charter flights travelling directly from Latin America to Europe carrying significant cocaine consignments. Sailing vessels have also become more accessible and easier to pilot, and with growing traffic between the Caribbean and Europe, this has become an increasingly popular way to move large consignments. Reception in Europe has also seen increasing diversification. Spain has historically been the natural home for Latin American traffickers, with its linguistic and cultural links, and thanks to their legions with the Galician smugglers, Spain has become the principal entry point for cocaine in Europe from the late 1980s. Spain has, however, been eclipsed by Belgium and the Netherlands. Here, traffickers have been attracted by the efficiency of the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam, which, combined with the excellent transport infrastructure, can rapidly place a container almost anywhere in Europe. Drug traffickers appreciate that kind of efficiency as well as many other businessmen and revel in the sheer volume of containers flowing through these ports which provides endless opportunities to camouflage their consignments. However, as seizures increase in these ports, traffickers have also switched to secondary European ports where there's far less scrutiny on incoming containers. Traffickers have also shipped substantial quantities of cocaine indirectly to Europe via West Africa and North Africa using containers, maritime shipping and drug mules on commercial air flights. Seizures on this route have fluctuated over the past 20 years, but there are signs that it may be on an upswing again. As Latin American criminals moved downstream to Europe to sell their wares, some European mafias began to move upstream to get closer to the sources of production and secure better prices for cocaine. Unsurprisingly, it was the Italian Mafia that pioneered the move upstream, securing cheap cocaine in Colombia and establishing a permanent presence in Latin America in the 1990s. Buying at the source in Colombia and arranging transport back to Europe meant the Italians could pocket most of the massive profits themselves. Other European mafias soon began to mimic this model and it has become ever more common today. However, it is misleading in today's criminal landscape to think purely of national mafias the cocaine trade is now populated by a variety of different types of criminal syndicates, which are made up of many different and mixed nationalities. There are no longer criminal structures like the Medellin cartel that controlled cocaine production in Colombia and sold their drugs on the streets of Miami and New York. Today, criminal networks rely on subcontracting much of the work to different transport specialists, assassins for hire, corruption nodes, money launderers and legal actors like lawyers, accountants and bankers. However, despite the boom years that has been enjoying the cocaine trade, all businesses have been impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. For Kevin Mills, recently retired from the National Crime Agency after a 31-year career and now works as a security and investigations consultant in Bogota, the cocaine trade to Europe has been hit on six fronts by the coronavirus pandemic. Number one, reduction in container traffic from Latin America to Europe. In the first months of the pandemic, there was a significant drop in the volume of containers moving into Europe. A rise in seizures in Europe in 2020 might be the result of traffickers trying to move the same amount of cocaine in a shrinking flow of containers, thus running a greater risk of discovery. Number two, the prohibition on personal travel in and out of Latin America over the last five months. There is no ability for criminals and planners to fly out of Colombia as there is no incoming traffic which makes planning and closing deals more complicated. And there is no outgoing travel that permits a small but frequent supply of mules or cocaine that is hidden in air cargo or suitcases. Number three, 
the huge drop in sailing craft crossing the Atlantic and moving through the Caribbean. The yachting threat has been really resurgent in the last two or three years from the Eastern Caribbean. That is completely dead in the water at the moment because vessels cannot move between countries, said Mills. Number four, the overall reduction in the maritime traffic means that any vessels loitering off the coast of South America attract a great deal of attention and nations are now paying extra attention to any foreign vessels seeking to dock. The movements of heavy cargo tugs, fishing vessels, again, because of the issue of crossing maritime borders, has taken a huge hit. Number five, the huge drop in air traffic, including commercial flights, charter flights and private planes. Few nations are given the same sort of permissions for pr private planes to land, meaning that charter flights cannot operate as before, and the overall reduction in flying means that illegal flights have less traffic in which to hide. Number six, drop in sales outlets in Europe, with fewer parties, most social venues being closed, and people with money to spend, thanks to the crisis and its economic impact. However, Mills believes this is a temporary state of affairs and traffickers are already adapting to changing conditions. In the long term, the flow of cocaine will re-establish itself at pre-coronavirus levels and even likely increase. Please stay tuned for part two. In September 1989, Los Angeles police broke upon the cheap padlock that was the only security on a warehouse in the northern suburb of Silmar. Inside, they discovered more than 21 tonnes of cocaine and $10 million in cash, packed into over a 1,000 cardboard boxes. The Silmar Hall was, and still is, the biggest cocaine seizure ever recorded. It also marked a milestone in the history of the cocaine trade, then dominated by the Medellin and Cali drug cartels. The tremors in the criminal underworld caused by the seizure would be felt not just in Latin America and the United States, but across the Atlantic in Europe. At the time of the seizure, crackdowns on the Colombian cartels favoured air and sea routes through the Caribbean had seen them grow increasingly dependent on the Mexicans' ability to move drugs across the US border, and the Mexicans knew it. In Silmar, the cocaine in the warehouses was being held hostage by Mexican traffickers who refused to release it to its Colombian owners as a dispute raged over payment. According to the US Drug Enforcement Administration, the staggering financial loss of the seizure drove the two sides to thrash out a new deal, any such standoffs in the future. The Colombians began to pay the Mexicans, not with cash, but of up to 50% of the cocaine from each shipment. Over time, the model spread, and the Mexicans became not just transporters, but also owners of the cocaine and the major distributors in the United States. As the DEA concluded in its official history of the drug trade, this shift to using cocaine as compensation for transportation services radically changed the role and sphere of influence on the Mexico-based trafficking organisations in the US cocaine trade. Within a decade, the balance of power in cocaine trafficking to the United States had decisively shifted to the Mexicans, who established stranglehold on the US border crossing points, reducing the Colombians to the role of suppliers. The Colombians were left with two options. The first was to fight the Mexicans and seek to break their monopoly in order to regain direct access to the world's biggest cocaine market. This would involve not only challenging the ever-powerful and violent Mexican cartels on their home turf, but also making the Colombians priority targets for the US increasingly belligerent anti-narcotics efforts. Or they could cede the US market to the Mexicans while turning their attentions to new markets with higher prices and lower risks, markets like Europe. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime estimates that in 1998, as the Mexicans were starting to tighten their chokehold on the US market, 267 tonnes of cocaine were trafficked into the United States, compared to 63 tonnes to Europe. Ten years later, the US market had declined 38% to 165 tonnes. The European market, meanwhile, had grown 98%, rising to 124 tonnes. Perhaps even more tellingly, the UNODC estimated that by 2009, trafficking to Europe was the source of half the profits made by cocaine traffickers in South America, Central America and the Caribbean, while the US market accounted for a third. Another decade on, and that gap had almost certainly widened. Cocaine trafficking into Europe is now hitting historic highs. In 2017, authorities in the European Union, Norway and Turkey seized a record 142 tonnes of cocaine. 
twice as much as the year before and over 20 tonnes higher than the previous record, according to the EU's annual drug report. The same report estimates that 100 to 137 tonnes of cocaine was then consumed in the region that year. However, even at the upper end of this estimate, this would mean European authorities seized over half of all the product cocaine traffickers shipped into Europe, which would represent a startling and highly unlikely success rate. International law enforcement and underworld sources in both Europe and the Americas say they expect around 15-20% to 20 of the shipments to be seized at any one link in the supply chain. This would equate to 568 to 804 tonnes successfully trafficked into or through Europe in 2017. Yet even this huge figure may not reflect today's situation. Since then, major entry points such as Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy, the United Kingdom and Germany have all posted huge increases in seizures. If these are representative of a broader regional trend, the current figure may be hundreds of tonnes higher. In part, the rise in seizures may be explained by European security forces getting better at seizing cocaine, but this alone does not stand up as an explanation. According to the 2019 EU drug report, wholesale prices have been in a long-term decline, while purity levels have been increasing and retail prices remain stable or slightly fell, all indications that the market is not short of product. Data on seizures and consumption suggest the US market nevertheless remains slightly larger. Quantity, though, is just part of the story. Europe remains a more lucrative market than the United States. Calculations by the UNODC indicate that the average wholesale price in Europe in 2017, weighted by population, was $41,000 compared to $28,000 in the United States. Europol estimates that the EU retail market was worth between 7.6 and 10.5 billion euros in 2017. Drug traffickers, though, not only look at the rewards, they also weigh the risks. And while trafficking to the United States today is fraught with risk, in Europe, the odds are stacked heavily in the criminals' favour. The United States has waged a relentless war on drugs in Latin America since the 1980s. And while this has done little to reduce drug consumption or less the societal impact of the organised crime, the Americans have become highly adept at two things, seizing drugs and locking up drug traffickers. European authorities, in contrast, have a light footprint upstream and have shown limited interest in prioritising the arrest, prosecution and incarceration of Latin American traffickers. The differences between the two approaches can be illustrated in the figures. According to the US Office of National Drug Control Policy, the United States spends $17.4 billion on the supply side reduction, which includes drug interdiction, law enforcement investigations and prosecutions. While no such precise figures have been published by the EU, the data available suggests the EU spends between 3 and 4 billion on the supply side reduction. Extradition numbers also show the contrast. While publicly available data is patchy, it allows for some comparisons. A European Commission study of extradition between Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean between 2008 and 2011 showed European nations extradited an average of 61 people from the region a year. In contrast, between 2002 and 2010, the United States extradited an average of 137 people a year from Colombia alone, according to an investigation by El Tiempo. Europe has one final advantage over the United States for traffickers. It is far more open market. The Mexican cartels maintain their grip over the US borders, controlling them with extreme violence. In doing so, they maintain their monopoly over much of the wholesale cocaine market in the United States, reducing traffickers from other countries to the roles of suppliers and transporters. But there are no such barriers in Europe, where anyone with the capital, contacts and know-how can enter the cocaine market. There are also countless routes into the continent. As such, Latin American traffickers can significantly increase their profits by selling on the European wholesale market while reducing the risk, and European mafias can come upstream to increase their share of the profits. Today, cocaine production is booming. Colombia has seen a year-on-year -year increase in cocaine production since 2012. The latest monitoring results from Peru and Bolivia, which according to chemical analysis of seized drugs, account for around a quarter of the cocaine entering Europe, show a 36 and 10% rise in coca cultivation respectively. The world is awash with cocaine.
In Colombia, members of the Mexican cartels are an ever more common sight. They dispatch their emissaries to strike deals and to monitor and oversee production and trafficking. They have even financed Colombian armed groups to ensure a constant flow of cocaine, according to multiple investigations. However, this is not a sign of strength or an indication that the Mexicans are taking over the Colombian drug trade. It is a sign of their frustration with the increasingly fragmented and decentralised Colombian underworld and the difficulty they have getting the cocaine they need to feed the US market. From the mighty trafficking federation of the Norte del Val cartel to the guerrillas of the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia, all of the most reliable Colombian suppliers have splintered into a multitude of much smaller networks. This makes it difficult for the Mexicans to guarantee the consistent supply of large quantities of cocaine they need to feed their supply lines. For the Colombians, selling cocaine to the Mexicans for the US market still accounts for a large percentage of their business. But for many traffickers, the European market is now their priority. The kilo they might sell for free grand to the Mexicans goes for more than 10 times that on a wholesale market in Europe. With more cocaine to move than ever, Colombian traffickers have also been aggressively developing other markets around the globe, some with incredible and barely tapped potential. Markets like China, with its vast potential and growing prosperity, or Australia, where wholesale cocaine prices range from 110,000 to 154,000 per kilo in 2018, according to UNODC, a markup that could run as high as 7,000% for the Colombian traffickers. The signs of the entry into these markets of big-time traffickers are clear. Previously, Asia and Oceania were largely fed by small-volume trafficking using mules or career mail. However, in recent years, these countries have begun to see shipping containers arriving at the ports with hundreds and even thousands of kilos. In September 2019, Malaysian authorities seized 12 tonnes of cocaine in one shipment alone. Nevertheless, for the time being, Europe's market size, prices, risk levels and its shipping infrastructure moving millions of tonnes of goods to every corner of the earth make it arguably the most attractive cocaine market in the world. When Colombian cartels made their first tentative deals with the Galician smugglers and the Italian mafia to move cocaine into Europe in the 1980s, it would have been unthinkable that one day they might shy away from the United States in favour of the old continent. But today it is a business no-brainer. Please stay tuned for part three. On April 30th, 1984, the Mercedes taking Colombian Justice Minister Rodrigo Lara Benilla home after work was strafed with machine gun fire by the feared hitmen or sicarios of drug lord Pablo Escobar. The Medellin cartel had declared war on the state and that war was set to motion a strange series of events that would kickstart the European cocaine trade. The killing of Lara Benilla one of the few politicians to defy the power of the Medellin and Cadley cartels in the early 1980s sparked a backlash from the previously cowed Colombian state. It immediately signed into law the drug lord's worst fear, extradition to the United States. Fear of capture and extradition drove an exodus of top drug traffickers to more friendly climes. Pablo Escobar fled to Panama, protected by his friend, the dictator, General Manuel Noriega. Others like Medellin Cartel Capo, Jorge Ochea Vasquez and Cali Cartel Head Gilberto Rodriguez Orochea chose Spain. They lived in luxurious obscurity under false names, collecting opulent properties and high-end vehicles in Madrid, according to media reports at the time. But then in November 1984, they were both arrested and sent to the infamous Carabanchal prison. The two top Colombian traffickers, who would go on to become deadly rivals, shared the prison, not only with each other, but also with Spain's top contraband traffickers from the region of Galicia, among them the legendary smuggler José Ramón Prado, better known by his alias Sito Minanco. The Galicians, the Colombians quickly realised, were exactly what they needed to expand their business into Europe. These smugglers could provide the vehicles and safety to safely bring in anything along the long, rocky coast of Galicia. They could also offer the Colombians one of the most coveted criminal advantages, corruption networks that penetrated deep into local elites. The time they shared in prison gave birth to a criminal alliance that became central to large-scale cocaine trafficking to Europe. It also set Spain on the path to becoming the main European entry point for Colombian cocaine and the European operations base of Latin American organised crime.
In contrast to the United States, where the crack explosion had democratised cocaine use and around 6% of the population reported regular use of the drug, the European cocaine market in the early 1980s was small. But in this small market and its high prices, the Colombians saw enormous potential for growth. Furthermore, in the 1980s, the United States was beginning to ramp up its war on drugs by strengthening agencies like the Drug Enforcement Administration, developing tools such as extradition and increasing its upstream presence. The Europeans were taking no such action. With the conditions ripe for the Colombians to exploit, the Galicians offered a secure pipeline into the heart of Europe. Galicia, with its 1,500 kilometres of coastline, crammed in between Portugal and France, has been a smuggler's paradise for centuries. In Farina, his book on the birth of the cocaine trade in Spain, journalist Nacho Caritero described how smuggling was not even a criminal offence until 1982, and how, even after this date, it was socially accepted profession. In the 1960s, cigarette smuggling became Galicia's biggest illicit market, and by the 1980s, it was a multi-million dollar business that corrupted customs and police officers, as well as local politicians. Farina documents how the first contact between the Galician smugglers and Colombian cocaine traffickers were made in Panama, where the Galicians would go to launder their tobacco smuggling profits. Together, they organised some test shipments, but it was when Ochoa and Rodrigo Arechea met the Galicians in Carabanchel prison that the arrangements for large-scale cocaine smuggling to Spain took shape. To bring in the drugs, Galician fishing vessels would sail to Colombia and back, dropping off the cocaine at high sea on their return, according to Caratero. From there, go-fast boats and other small vessels would bring it into land. Both parties would keep one member of the other group hostage until the drugs were handed back to the Colombians, who then took care of the wholesale distribution to their European criminal groups, including Italian mafia organisations like the Camorra and the Drangheta. For their part, the Galicians earned 30% of the profits, according to Caratero. The impact of the new nexus forming between the Colombians, Galicians and Italians soon became apparent. Data compiled by the European Nations Office on Drugs and Crime suggests a gradual but steady increase in the size of the European market throughout the 1990s, as seizures climbed while prices fell. But Galicia was just the beginning. New routes began opening all around Spain. By the mid-2000s, the country was recorded the third highest cocaine seizures in the world, according to the UNODC, and the seizures were increasingly made outside of Galicia, including Andalusia, Valencia and Barcelona, as traffickers began to use other modus operandi, especially shipping containers. The Colombians' grown European wholesale business, meanwhile, required them to set up operations on the continent. Spain, with its shared language and commercial and cultural ties, was their natural home. And as for the European market grew in importance to the Colombians, so did the Colombians' presence in Spain. By the 2000s, authorities became aware that this included not only trafficking networks, but also oficinas de cobro, or collection offices, the name given to the Colombian criminal structures dedicated to providing services to drug traffickers, above all debt collection and assassinations. One of the most notorious Colombian oficinas to operate in Spain was known as Señoras de Acido, Lords of Acid, which was based in Madrid. Colombians set up the network in an effort to export to Spain the organised crime model of the Oficina de Envigado, the original Colombian Oficina, which was created to collect debts for Pablo Escobar and his Medellin cartel. The Sonoras de Acido were directly from Colombia to Luis de Valas Jimenez, alias Pampo, a member of the Norte del Val cartel leadership. The Oficina contract killers were involved in kidnapping, murders, debt collection and extortion. The group earned its name after dissolving in acid the headless corpse of a relative of a drug trafficker with an outstanding debt. But it was not just the foot soldiers of cocaine traffickers that set up shop in Spain. In 2006, one of Colombia's most wanted traffickers, Leonidas Vargas, was arrested in Madrid. In 2009, Vargas was freed on conditional bail due to health reasons, but he was then assassinated in his hospital bed as the Colombian cartel battles played out on Spanish soil. Since then, high-profile traffickers from some of Colombia's notorious cocaine trafficking networks, such as Eurobinos and Oficina de Evigado, have also been captured in Spain, in one case reportedly while living in the same gated community as Real Madrid soccer stars Cristiano Ronaldo and Fernando Torres. In 2019, the Spanish police stumbled upon their own white whale, which they had pursued without success for over a decade. 
a drug-filled semi-submersible that had crossed the Atlantic. The vessel had carried three tons of cocaine over 9,000 kilometres along the Amazon River and across the ocean. But the crew were forced to abandon it off the coast of Galicia after suffering mechanical problems. Spanish police sources told Insight Crime that Latin American traffickers have used semi-submersibles to move cocaine into Spain since the mid-2000s. Colombian drug lord Diego Rostrojo of the Rostrojos was a pioneer often operating out of Venezuela, where he was finally captured in 2012. The discovery of semi-submersibles, though, offered a glimpse into a new generation of low-profile Galician traffickers that now dominate the business. The Spanish groups working with the semi-submersibles are investing in their own operation. The old guard of Galicians is still active in the cocaine trade. A network of over 30 Galicians, allegedly led by Cito Minanco, was dismantled in 2018 in the largest police operation against drug trafficking in Galicia since 1990. The crime group was linked to a four-ton shipment aboard a tugboat seized in international waters and a 616 kilogram seizure made in a container found in Horn, the Netherlands, both in 2017. However, the main players in today's Spanish cocaine trade do not seek the legendary status of their predecessors, instead preferring the anonymity of a low-profile life among local elites. These traffickers are part of high society and live a normal life, some of them send their kids to the same schools as the judges here. Their lives are not super luxurious, but they have a lot of money without drawing attention to themselves, without the fancy car. Colombian traffickers, too, remain deeply embedded in the Spanish cocaine trade, hiding among a diaspora that has grown from around 10,000 in 1998 to 270,000 today. The ongoing importance of Spain to their operations is reflected in the figures. 85% of Colombians convicted of drug trafficking in Europe are incarcerated in Spain. Madrid is regarded as a principal operating base. The capital's luxury hotels are used to meet associates, while reception points along the coast are easy to reach from the city. All major Colombian drug traffickers working in Europe use Spain. Many have established sales in the country, although higher-ups in the organisations only have become to oversee the final stages of trafficking deals. There are permanent low-level representatives in the country, but if we arrest a top guy from one of these groups, it is always during the last phase of a drug trafficking operation. The Colombians commonly dispatch shipments with multiple owners. Part of the load belongs to them, and they will sell that on the wholesale market. The rest belongs to other traffickers from both Europe and Latin America, who pay the Colombians to source and move their cocaine. Colombian officinas de Cobro also continue to operate, policing and protecting traffickers' interests. While some are allied with specific groups, they often work as hired guns for the highest bidders. While numerous Colombian criminal organisations use Spain, one group more than any other have caught the attention of Spanish police. We have all types of Colombian groups in Madrid, but lately we see a lot of members from Urabinos, said Chief Commissioner Martinez. The Urabinos sell cocaine wholesale, offer logistical services to independent traffickers and use Spain for their money laundering operations. Today's cocaine routes are no longer concentrated in Galicia, but pass through Spain's coast islands, ports and airports all around the country. Most seizures are made on vessels or in container ports like Algeciras, Barcelona and Valencia, where an estimated 40-50% to 50 of all cocaine in Spain arrives. And the loads are getting bigger, as shown by the nearly 9-tonne haul seized in Algeciras in 2018, a Spanish record. Furthermore, other routes have opened up, such as using the hashish trafficking lines that run from Morocco to the beaches along the Costa del Sol. The complete infrastructure, GoFast and other boats for hashish, is used to transport the cocaine that enters via Africa. However, Spain has now been displaced as Europe's top cocaine entry point by Belgium and its port at Antwerp, a reflection of the critical role of container shipping in trafficking today. And although year after year it has ranked in the top three European nations for seizures, recently there has been a sharp drop-off from a high of 50 tonnes in 2018 to just 21 tonnes in the first 10 months of 2019. Police believe this is a sign that while Spain's strategic importance continues, its importance as a trafficking route is declining. Colombian organisations use Spain as a meeting point with organisations from Serbia, Eastern Europe and Africa, but is no longer the principal arrival point for drugs. Such international traffickers, along with other organised crime groups from the Balkans, the British Isles, the Netherlands and elsewhere, also now run their own networks in Spain. And while they may continue to work with the Colombians and the Galicians downstream in Spain, even more of these groups are also working upstream in Latin America, following the trail cut by the Colombians other main partners from the cartel era, the Italian Mafia. 
Operation Tiburon Galloway began as a local investigation by prosecutors into the Italian region of Calabria in 2001, but quickly snowballed into a multinational, multi-agency investigation. Over five years, prosecutors uncovered a vast cocaine trafficking and money laundering conspiracy spanning both Italy and Colombia, and even the retirement plans of one of Colombia's most notorious warlords. The investigation into the alliance between the Salvatore Mancuso a commander of the Colombia's paramilitary army, the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, and the Andrangheta Mafia revealed just how far the Italians had come in the cocaine trade, all the way to the source. According to reports in the Italian media, the evidence showed the Italians were buying cocaine from Mancuso in Colombia at $3,000 a kilo, then organizing its shipment through Colombian ports and via Venezuela to Europe, where it would fetch prices up to 15 times higher on the wholesale market. Mancuso, in turn, went into business with the Italians in Colombia, even in opening an Italian restaurant in the Caribbean city of Barranquilla, frequented by mobsters and local elites alike. And as the paramilitaries negotiated their demobilisation with the Colombian government, he sent one of his personal fixers to Italy to scout property deals. According to an investigation by El Espectador, communications intercepts between Andrangheta members hinted at why. Mancuso is at the end of the peace process, and they will surely give him a couple of years in prison. Then after he has come into Italy, Mancuso's chief mafia business partner, told his son. Mancuso did not get his retirement to Italy, at least not yet. He was instead extradited to United States where he served in a 12-year prison sentence on drug trafficking charges. Since then the European cocaine trade has changed and evolved but the networks organised along the same lines as the Mancuso mafia ring are becoming more common as ever more European traffickers move upstream in search of cheap cocaine and coordinate its dispatch to Europe directly. Nonetheless it was the Italians with their particular brand of organisation, entrepreneurship and criminal efficiency who pioneered the move upstream and it is still the Italians who have the most far-reaching and sophisticated upstream operation. Italian involvement in the cocaine trade even predates the rise of the Colombian cartels, with records of mafia members arrested in Brazil for cocaine trafficking as far back as 1972. But at first, cocaine was a minor part of a broad criminal portfolio that included everything from international heroin trafficking to lo local waste disposal rackets. When Colombia's Medellin and Cali cartels began to ramp up cocaine trafficking into Europe in the 1980s, the Italians were among the main wholesale buyers, moving and selling the product that Galician smugglers brought in for the Colombians. But the Italians' experience in the heroin business offered them a major competitive advantage over other European mafias getting into the cocaine trade. They exported heroin from Europe into the United States, so they had lots of experience and they had established distribution and importation chains. The more forward-thinking mafioso understood that this experience in criminal infrastructure could be used to traffic the cocaine themselves. They came to Colombia so they could be closer to the supply and coordinate shipments to their standards. By the early 1990s, Italian cocaine brokers were stationed themselves in the country where they worked quietly reshaping the European cocaine trade. The most infamous was the baby-faced trafficker Roberto Panunzi, the man dubbed Corpenicus of Cocaine by Italian crime writer Roberto Saviano. Panuzzi's first realisation was that the heroin he had trafficked for years was worth much more to Latin American traffickers than the cocaine they shipped to Europe. As Saviano describes in his book, 000, he began a drug exchange of one kilo of heroin for 25 kilos of cocaine. His second realisation was that there was far, far more money to be made from cocaine upstream. By the early 1990s, Panuzzi had leveraged his cartel contacts in Colombia and his mafia contacts in Italy to set himself up as an upstream middleman, establishing himself as one of the original cocaine brokers. He worked for himself, brokering deals between the Medellin cartel and both the Cosa Nostra and Andrangheta mafias, but beholden to none of them. The cartel era was winding down, with the killing of Pablo Escobar in 1994 and the capture of the Cali cartel bosses in 1995, ushering in a new generation of traffickers and organisations. Panuzzi was captured in Medellin less than two months after Escobar's death. The police officials arrested him, turned down his offer of a million dollars to let him go. Nevertheless, he was released five years later after prosecutors ran out of time to bring their case against him. By that time, Colombia's criminal monoliths had splintered into federations of smaller trafficking networks. For the Italian mafia, that represented new opportunities and their footprint upstream began to grow. The Mafia had proved the most adept at moving in the new cocaine trade, was not one of Italy's infamous and storied Mafias like the Cosa Nostra, but the Andrangheta, 
a relatively minor federation of family crime clans from the impoverished region of Calabria. The Andrangheta plotted a chart upstream by turning a weakness into a strength. Poverty and a lack of opportunities drove a mass migration of Calabrians and among their numbers were Endrina, the mafia clans that made up the Andrangheta network. Migrants from Calabria created communities around the world and they strengthened the connections with the Calabrian region. This was the first base of their network. These migrant crime clans not only dedicated themselves to crime, but also setting up legal businesses as front for their legal activities and to launder money. Among them were the export companies, which the Italians used to ship cocaine to Europe in cargo and containers. What would become the main method of shipping cocaine to Europe? This upstream presence allowed the Adrangheta to cut out the independent brokers and control more of the supply chain directly. They have their people in key positions in the supply chain. This is not only in Italy, but also an international level, thanks to the people they located in key strategic roles around the world. Italian migration was the key to the alliance between the Andrangheta and the Salvatore Mancuso, who was the son of an Italian migrant from the southwestern region of Campania and came from the city of Monteria in Colombia's Caribbean, home to a significant Italian diaspora. Mancuso, though, was far from the only Andrangheta supplier, as their upstream brokers set to work making other connections, not only with the right-wing paramilitaries, but also guerrilla insurgents. By 2006, as the AUC was coming to an end of its demobilisation process as part of the peace deal with the Colombian government, the Adrangheta was handling up to 80% of the European cocaine imports. In 2008, Salvatore Mancuso was extradited to the United States for continued to traffic cocaine after his demobilisation along with 13 other paramilitary commanders. It was a watershed moment for the cocaine trade, as the old guard walked off the criminal stage and a new generation jostled to take their place in the Colombian underworld. Since then, the European cocaine trade has opened up, both geographically and strategically. Now there are more routes and more actors involved than ever before, but the Italian mafia remain at the forefront of this expansion. Police and intelligence sources all around Latin America report their presence. In Brazil today, one of the main dispatch points to Europe, according to Europol, police sources described how they uncovered an alliance between the Adrangheta and Brazil's most powerful criminal group, the First Capital Command, in 2017. In Costa Rica, intelligence sources say they are the most common European actor found trafficking in the country, while in Peru, police reports that the Italians are among the main finances of cocaine shipments. Brokers, many of them reside upstream, remain the linchpin of their operations, with their connections to suppliers and dispatch networks. The Adrangheta have brokers in these countries, typically in Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, the Dominican Republic and Costa Rica. And these brokers try to organise the sales from these countries using legal businesses. In these countries, the Adrangheta logistics sells for trafficking cocaine through the movement of goods for export to North America and Europe. An investigation into one of these brokers, Nicola Assisi, offered a glimpse into how they work. According to the investigation, Assisi established himself as one of the cocaine world's leading brokers after he inherited the contact book from one of the legendary traffickers, Pasquale Mirando, who had worked alongside Roberto Peduzzi as one of the pioneers of the Italian cocaine trade. When Mirando was murdered by rivals in 2002, Assisi moved to take over the upstream networks he had left behind. Evidence collected by investigators showed how Assisi sourced cocaine from suppliers in Peru, Paraguay and Brazil. He then contacts the PCC to move the cocaine to the port of Santos and dispatch it to Europe, where his Andrangheta clients are waiting. Assisi, like Roberto Panuzzi before him, is an independent operator rather than a member of an Andrangheta clan. Most trafficking networks prefer it this way because it avoids the alerts that no Mafia members would raise upstream. They do not directly form a part of the Mafia in Italy. They have not been arrested and they have not been investigated. The relationship between Assisi and the PCC is also typical of today's Italian trafficking networks, where the brokers contact local criminal groups to handle the export. However, in some cases, the Italians have set up their own front businesses for sending cocaine shipments. One of these cases ended with murder, when an Italian trafficker who set up a front fruit company in Costa Rica was gunned down in San Jose after a lost shipment. Italian mafia operations have been uncovered in many other countries that have become, or at risk of becoming, major cocaine export platforms supplying the European market, such as Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, Suriname, Guyana, Uruguay, Argentina, Bolivia, the Dutch Caribbean and Chile. The Adrangheta alone operates in more than 30 countries around the world. 
However, these networks are far more than just cocaine trafficking cells. They're also master manipulators of illicit finance flows, which they channel through Latin America and the Caribbean. In some places, they have turned their money into power by spreading corruption and penetrating vulnerable states. One of the most audacious attempts to co-opt upstream states came on the Caribbean island of Caracal. After gaining autonomy from the Netherlands in 2010, Caracal elected Gerrit Schrock as its first prime minister. However, the country's first independent government was comprised by Francesco Corallo, a casino owner in the region, and according to Italian prosecutors, an international drug trafficker who was an important member of the Sicilian Mafia. Investigations into Schutt revealed how Corallo bribed the Curacoan politician to gain access to its confidential government information and to secure the appointment of his relatives and allies in critical positions at the Central Bank, the Gaming Board and within Schutt's cabinet. In 2016, Schott was convicted of forgery, official bribery and money laundering. Latin America and the Caribbean are also used as a refuge for Italian mafioso on the run from the law, needing to lie low or looking to take semi-retirement by laundering money in the sunshine. Just such a criminal retirement ring was broken up in the Dominican Republic earlier this year when Interpol arrested eight Camorra fugitives who had fled Italy after being convicted of crimes ranging from cocaine trafficking to embezzlement. The men, all but one over 50, were living quiet lives, allegedly laundering money through restaurants and tourist businesses. The Italians are no longer the only European criminals setting up operations upstream. More and more groups, above all from the Balkans, have followed the path they have forged upstream to maximise profits from the cocaine trade. Today it is common to hear of Serbs buying cocaine at the source in Peru, or Albanians organising shipments through the ports of Ecuador. However, the Italian generations of experience moving both drugs and money, their global networks and their proven capacity to innovate and adapt will ensure they will remain among the most powerful and innovative criminal syndicates, posing serious security threats not only in Europe but also upstream in Latin America. Cocaine is a criminal steroid. Those that gain access to its riches enjoy accelerated growth and power quickly usually leaving a trail of violence and corruption in their wake. And today, there are more opportunities than ever for criminal groups to access cocaine in both Latin America and Europe. The cocaine trade has spawned some of the most powerful and notorious criminal structures on the planet. In Colombia, it turned a ragtag band of smugglers into the Medellin cartel, which declared war on the state itself. In Mexico, it turned rural drug farmers into the heads of multinational criminal conglomerates of astonishing reach and power. While the US market was initially the main driver of this criminal evolution over the last two decades, the growing European market has also played a key role. In Latin America, cocaine money from Europe has seen Venezuelan corruption networks emerge as major transnational traffickers, while in Brazil it has turned a prison gang into South America's fastest growing criminal syndicate. In Europe, meanwhile, while Galician smugglers and Italian mafias were the first to benefit, they were soon joined by others above all criminal organisations from the Balkans. Today, the European cocaine trade is more democratised and international on both sides of the Atlantic, with networks cooperating across national and ethnic boundaries. And a historic production boom is offering more opportunities than ever for these actors to get their hands on the cocaine steroids, raising the threat posed by organised crime in Europe. In 1976, Pablo Escobar was arrested for trafficking cocaine for the first time when police discovered 39 kilograms of cocaine hidden in the tyre of a car he had driven up from Ecuador. When he is arrested for the second time, after 15 years spent trafficking countless tonnes of cocaine into the United States and Europe, he negotiated his own incarceration in a purpose-built luxury prison. Between these two arrests, he was elected to Colombia's Congress, then waged a successful war against the government and police ordering scores of assassinations and terrorist attacks, and he earned enough money to secure a place on the Forbes billionaire list for seven years running. When Escobar finally negotiated his surrender, it was only after extradition had been taken off the statute books and on the condition that he could run his own opulent prison. Escobar ultimately fell, not because the state defeated him, but when a civil war broke out between two different elements of the Medellin cartel and many of his own people turned on him. These rebels waged a dirty war against his network, using Escobar's own tactics against him while cooperating with the security forces. The fall of Escobar sparked the transition from the all-powerful cartels to federations of smaller trafficking groups, but the cocaine trade retained its transformative power. One of the federations was the paramilitaries of the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, 
a network of allied private armies purportedly formed to combat the threat from Marxist guerrillas, but in most cases more focused on controlling the drug trade. The AUC used a cocaine steroid to turn themselves into the most fearsome drug trafficking military machine in history, employing brutal and often indiscriminate violence to secure control of coca field, cocaine laboratories and major trafficking arteries. When they demobilised in 2006, more than 30,000 fighters handed over their weapons and their dominion of up to a quarter of a century. As control of the US cocaine trade shifted to Mexico in the 1990s, it was the turn of the Mexican organised crime to take advantage of the cocaine steroids. Today, the most infamous drug trafficking group is Mexico's Sinaloa cartel. The Sinaloans began as drug farmers and moved into marijuana trafficking, but it was the cocaine trade that made it what it is today a multi-billion dollar operation with connections to the upper echelons of the Mexican state and criminal interests in as many as 50 countries worldwide. However, the European cocaine trade has, and is, transforming criminal dynamics. One of the first major trafficking routes to Europe outside of Colombia to emerge was Venezuela, which was the main dispatch point for Europe-bound cocaine for the first decade of the 2000s. The profits from this trafficking were central to the rise of the Cartel of the Sons, a loose trafficking network made up of the Venezuelan security forces and government. Initially, the Cartel of the Sons was little more than a collection of small cells of military officials paid off by traffickers to ensure their passage of shipments. Their job was simply to let the drugs enter and move through the country. They would also guard shipments and protect them against hijackings. However, as the European cocaine money rolled in, the ranks of officials involved got higher and the role they played in the trade got bigger. Today, the president himself Nicolas Maduro, his family and many of his top lieutenants have been indicted on drug trafficking charges. Today the main trafficking bridge to Europe is no longer Venezuela but Brazil. Here too cocaine money has transformed the underworld. Profits from trafficking to Europe have allowed Brazil's most feared criminal group, the First Capital Command, to complete its transition from a prison gang to a transnational actor with influence in Brazil, Bolivia and Paraguay, as well as a seat at the top table of the drug trade. The PCC was already powerful, running not only prisons but controlling criminal enclaves and running criminal economies such as the drug sales across swaths of Brazil, especially in many of the urban slums known as favelas. Its recent explosive growth is due in no small part to establishing control of several cocaine corridors like that from Bolivia through Paraguay and onto the port of Santos, opening up what has become one of the most important trafficking arteries into Europe. Police sources in Brazil, speaking on the condition of anonymity, described to Insight Crime how the PCC charge independent traffickers to use the corridor. But the top level leaders, the cupola, have also leveraged their control over the routes and their growing connections to cocaine brokers and international mafias, such as Italy's Andrangheta, to start moving their own shipments into Europe. The effects of the cocaine steroid can also be seen in Europe, where Galician smugglers and Italian mafia were the first to get a taste. The Galicians quickly evolved from cigarette smugglers to drug lords. With such corrupting power over local politicians, judges and security forces that by the 1990s debate raged over the Sicilianization of the region, referring to the Italian Mafia stronghold of Sicily. In Italy, the cocaine trade turned the Adrangheta from the poor relations of the Italian underworld to its richest and most powerful actor, far outstripping the famed Cosa Nostra. But the European market was no monopoly. And as it grew, it also democratised, offering access to the cocaine trade to any criminal actor enterprising enough to get a foothold. Chief among them had been the organised crime groups from the Balkans, above all the former Yugoslavian states of Serbia, Montenegro, Croatia and Bosnia, as well as Albania. The Balkan Wars in the 1990s opened the door for organised crime to flourish in the region. Networks formed to traffic arms, people and drugs, mostly heroin coming from Afghanistan and Turkey. The fighting also hardened people to violence, gave them criminal and military experience and skills and created a huge diaspora as tens of thousands of people fled the conflict. But it was only after Balkan criminals followed the path of the Italians and the Galicians into the cocaine trade that they became major transnational actors with transatlantic presence. One of the first to do so was Darko Sarek, the Balkan cocaine king, who replicated the model of the Italian mafia by building networks not only in Europe but also upstream. The so-called Balkans cocaine king Darko Sarek was born in Montenegro when it was still part of Yugoslavia but as Serbian citizenship. He mounted a billion dollar cocaine network with connections in both Latin America and Europe 
with the alleged complicity of powerful Serbian and Montenegrin businessmen and public officials. Authorities first became aware of his activities in 2005, but it wasn't until 2008 that an investigation into his network was opened. Sarek went on the run in 2009 after one of his shipments was seized in Uruguay. He eventually surrendered to the authorities in 2014 and was sentenced to 20 years. Evidence collected by investigators showed how he exported cocaine to Europe from Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay while compiling a criminal contact book that included Russian, Italian and Colombian crime syndicates. He also cultivated political ties at home, allegedly with the Montenegrin Prime Minister, Milo Djukanovic, and the Serb Minister of Foreign Affairs, Evika Dakic. However, following a multi-year, multinational manhunt, Sarek finally turned himself in to the Serbian authorities in 2014 and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Today, there are no kings of the Balkan cocaine trade, at least not any visible ones. Instead, Balkan criminals increasingly apply a crowdsourcing business model to cocaine trafficking, collectively investing in very large shipments according to the latest annual EU drug report. These are compiled from multiple sources, with Balkan traffickers now buying cocaine directly in Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and above all, in Peru and Brazil, before organising this dispatch through ports such as Guayaquil in Ecuador and Santos in Brazil. Once in Europe, the Balkan mafias break down shipments and move them onto different markets around the continent, in some cases even running end-to-end -end trade, buying in Latin America and selling at the retail level, as some Albanian networks now do in the United Kingdom. Currently, one of the most notorious Balkan networks is the Tito and Dino cartel, led by Edin Gashinin. The organisation has a strong footprint in Dubai and the Netherlands, and Bosnian police believe it controls one third of the cocaine that enters through the port of Rotterdam. The US Drug Enforcement Administration considers the network to be one of the 50 largest drug trafficking operations on the planet. The group is now one of the most important international actors in Peru. The Tito and Dino cartel is led by Edin Gassasin, who was born in Bosnia and Herzegovina and was raised in the Netherlands and started his criminal career by helping the Bosnian criminal Elvis Hodzik organise cocaine shipments from Peru to Europe. His organisation, Tito and Dino, is comprised of family members and friends from his old neighbourhood, Sarajevo. They are based in Dubai and predominantly traffic Peruvian cocaine through the Netherlands, but maintain connections to the Balkans through money laundering operations. Tito is the main buyer in Peru, said one Peruvian intelligence agent. He has made connections with dispatch networks at the ports of Calo and Piru to send drugs to Europe. The network has also played a key role in opening up routes from Chile, the agent added. They have migrated to Chile's port of Arica in order to send drug shipments bound for Europe, he said. Peruvian anti-narcotic sources said the organisation previously worked with one of South America's most established trafficking groups, the Andino Cartel, led by Ecuadorian trafficker Pedro Bejarano, but they severed ties some five years ago. Recent reports indicate they have now cut out the middlemen by securing exclusive supply deals with four Peruvian crime clans dedicated to cocaine production. However, the Tito and Dino cartel is neither the strongest Balkan group in Peru nor in Europe. Bigger still are the Serbs Grupo America, led by Mili Miljanic. Grupo America was born 30 years ago on the streets of Belgrade and today it is one of the most powerful Serb networks in South America. However, evidence of Grupo America's presence in the region is elusive with only one high-profile arrest linked to the group. Grupo America emerged in the 1990s. It is rumoured it was created by Serbian State Security Department as a death squad at the service of ex-Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic that was made up of Montenegrins trained in the United States before the Balkan Wars. Initially, America was led by Vokislav Rakovic, who used to work for the Italian Mafia in the United States, and it began trafficking cocaine and heroin between Colombia, the United States and Europe. After Rakovic was assassinated in 1996, Mili Miljanic took over the leadership of the group. Today, Grupo America predominantly operates cocaine routes into Europe, where the group even allegedly masterminded the prison break of one of their supplies in order to ensure the flow of drugs continues. This came in July 2016 when Peruvian police captured Balkan war veteran Voran Jaxic in the city of Tumbes as he tried to cross the border into Ecuador with over 40 false identities and 10 passports in his luggage. Jack Six is suspected of smuggling hundreds of tonnes of cocaine into the Netherlands and Belgium and was a wanted man in 25 countries. He was based in Argentina and bought cocaine in Peru and Ecuador, then turned it into the liquid form and exported it to Europe in shipments of wine bottles. European groups such as Tito and Dino, Grupo America, 
the Andrangheta and the Galicians have grown enormously wealthy and powerful of cocaine. But unlike the Mexican cartels in the United States, none of them have the capacity to shut other European actors out the market. Irish, British, French, Dutch, Turkish and Belgium actors also play a key role in the supply chain, both up and downstream, and growing presence of organised crime groups from Russia and other former states in Latin America. Furthermore, in today's ever more fluid underworld, none of these groups have the capacity to run cocaine routes from the production to retail single-handedly. Instead, they constantly form and dissolve networks and alliances with different actors all across the globe. In this democratic, decentralised and multinational underworld, criminal networks involved in the cocaine trafficking are multiplied on both continents, and many of them get their hands on the cocaine steroid by moving up the supply chain, thus increasing their profits. All they need is money and the right contacts, a broker that can source cocaine and a logistics specialist to traffic it. Above all, those that have mastered the complex world of container shipping. It was around 5am when the MSC Guyane cargo freighter docked in the port of Philadelphia on June 17, 2019. Instead of continuing on its scheduled destination, the Netherlands, it was boarded by federal agent who spent days using X-ray sniffer dogs and fibre optic scopes to inspect the thousands of containers on board. In seven of those, they found nearly 20 tonnes of cocaine. It was one of the biggest seizures in US history, but the story of the MSC Guyane says far more about where the ship was headed, Europe, than it does about the United States. It shows how trafficking with containers has reached such levels that traffickers feel confident dispatching multi-tonne cocaine shipments worth hundreds of millions of dollars to Europe. But more than that, it shows the constant criminal evolution in what is today the principal form of trafficking to Europe. The official version of the MSC Guyane seizure is that the traffickers used a method authorities called a drop-off. Court filings show that two of the six crew members arrested confessed to accepting €50,000 to haul aboard cocaine bricks from 14 smaller boats that approached the cargo ship throughout the night from the Peruvian coast. Peruvian anti-narcotics agents said it is true they are seeing ever more drop-offs as trafficking through the country's main port, Calau, has become riskier. However, they do not believe this is what happened with the MSC Guyane. According to these sources who spoke on conditional anonymity, it would have been very difficult for smaller vessels to pull up alongside the Guyane to pass the drugs aboard since its GPS tracking system showed it sailed through Peruvian waters at high speed and without stopping. Instead, they believe the operation was an example of another trafficking tactic, the adoption of rutas frias, or cold routes, ports with little known connection to the drug trade that have minimal security and raise few alarms. At least some of the cocaine the agents believe was loaded in Chile, a country rarely mentioned in connection with transatlantic cocaine trade. Whatever the case, it makes little difference to the implications of the seizure. Either way, the MSC Guyane Hall was a product of the ongoing game of hide-and-seek between traffickers and law enforcement, in which the traffickers are constantly looking for new methods and routes to stay one step ahead of authorities. In the original cocaine boom of the 1980s, the Colombian cartels favoured using light aircraft to reach the United States. Hopscotching across the Caribbean, crossing the Atlantic to reach Europe, is an entirely different proposition. According to the United States Office on Drugs and Crime, traffickers sent small quantities of cocaine to Europe via commercial air careers or mules. Larger cocaine shipments, meanwhile, were often dispatched on motherships, commonly fishing vessels, that were met on the high sea by go-fast boats, which would bring the drugs to shore, a technique perfected by Galician smugglers. Over the last decade, container shipping has become by far the most common form of trafficking into Europe. Every year, 750 million containers are shipped around the globe but less than 2% of these are inspected. This has provided traffickers with the perfect opportunity to reach global markets. The challenge is camouflaging large consignments of cocaine to minimise the risk of seizure while maximising profits. Container shipping was used to move cocaine at least as far back as the 1990s when the approach was pioneered by the Italian Mafia. But seizure figures illustrate a dramatic swing to containers in the mid to late 2000s which appeared to catch authorities unawares. European cocaine seizures increased rapidly between 1998 and 2006, from 32 tonnes to 121 tonnes. This was followed by a sudden decline from 2006 to 2009, from 121 tonnes to 53 tonnes. Even as other indicators like use rates, purity levels and street prices remain stable or increased, the figures suggest cocaine continue to flow uninterrupted right under authorities' noses. 
By the time seizure rates began to rise again, containers were the principal trafficking method detected. The 2016 EU Drug Markets report stated that, while in 2006, containers accounted for 10% of maritime seizures, by 2012 and 2013, that had increased by 75%. The switch to containers could have been a response to security measures or simply because traffickers were growing more aware of the advantages. Finding drugs in containers is like finding a needle in a haystack. Criminal networks have taken advantage of this security gap and are likely to continue doing so. It also could be a sign of the fact that volume of cocaine needed to feed the booming European market required the type of bulk transport capabilities offered by containers. When Europe became more important in the world market, containers became an advantage. There was a reorganisation of the cocaine business and became more international. When authorities began to understand the threat posed by cocaine trafficking, they paid more attention to which shipping lines from which countries were most commonly used for cocaine shipments. Traffickers responded by fanning out across the region in search of new ports that raised fewer suspicions. Traditional hotspots such as the Colombian ports of Turbo, Santa Marta, Buenaventura and Cartagena, as well as Calou in Peru, offer proximity to production zones, active shipping lines to Europe and highly sophisticated long-standing criminal networks and infrastructure. However, they are now routinely red flagged by European authorities and undergo more advanced security protocols. To combat the growing risk of interdiction, traffickers migrated to other ports around the region head into countries such as Ecuador, Costa Rica, Panama, the Dominican Republic and above all Brazil. Brazil's direct connections were production zones in Colombia, Peru and Bolivia on one side and numerous Atlantic coast container ports on the other made it an enticing prospect for traffickers seeking new routes to Europe. Add to this a powerful and rapidly evolving organised crime landscape and suddenly you have a principal cocaine bridge to Europe. First, the port of Santos became a hotspot, then others such as Paranagua and Atajai followed. Seizures, according to Brazilian customs data, soared from 4.5 tonnes in 2010 to 66 tonnes in 2019. The migration continues today, with evidence suggesting traffickers are turning ports with a relatively clean business history that are ill-prepared to stem the flow of cocaine, such as in Argentina, Uruguay and Chile. The same pattern can be seen in modus operandi when authorities implemented security measures. Traffickers responded by changing and improving their trafficking techniques. When authorities adapted, traffickers again came up with new alternatives. Early proponents of container trafficking favoured a strategy authorities called within the load, where cocaine is camouflaged in everyday exports. The within the load technique requires traffickers to run front companies which they either set up themselves or buy so they can be the owners of the business with a long history of clean exports. They then hide the cocaine in their ostensibly legal exports. Mostly this involved simply stuffing bricks of cocaine into boxes of cargo. But in other cases traffickers have even everything from hollowed out pineapples to barrels of hazardous chemicals and even chemically transformed the cocaine to disguise it as products like pet food or fertiliser. In addition within the load allows traffickers to have direct control over the shipment. However, since authorities began investigating and profiling export companies looking for suspicious patterns, the risk of interdiction has risen. This drove a shift to the rip-on, rip-off method, where traffickers avoid profiling by breaking open containers of legitimate exports to ship the drugs, then use cloned custom seals to conceal the tampering. Initially, rip-on, rip-off was favoured by smaller traffickers sending tens of kilograms. But as it has grown in popularity, the shipments have grown in size, with multi-ton hauls now commonplace. In most cases, the containers are contaminated as they are weighted to be loaded, meaning traffickers require access to the port areas. While there has been at least one case of so-called ninjas slipping into ports hidden in secret compartments in trucks, it is far easier to recruit port workers. In Peru, for example, the Barrio King gang's violent control of steer door crews allowed it to enforce a near monopoly on trafficking routes through Calau. However, in other cases, traffickers never enter the port, such as in Costa Rica, where traffickers recruit corrupt drivers, transport companies and container yard workers to load drugs into containers as they travel the long road between the agricultural zone of San Carlos and the port of Limon. Sources in several countries also say traffickers are increasingly looking to avoid the risk from profiling by hiding drugs in the structure of the container itself. Traffickers stuff bricks of cocaine into cavities in the wall, ceiling, floor and doors, or in the insulation or cooling equipment or refrigerated containers known as reefers. 
Using the container structures lowers the risk of authorities detecting fake custom seals, but it requires complicity from people inside shipping companies or container yards. Some traffickers have worked around this by mounting front companies to tamper with containers, such as in Costa Rica, where several sources described how traffickers set up container maintenance company to mask their activities. Authorities responded to the rise in these trafficking methods with the use of scanners in ports, which are deployed both at random and as a result of risk profiling. However, in some locations, such as the port in Santos in Brazil, traffickers are responded by contaminating containers that have already been inspected, cracking them open at the last possible moment before loading, as US prosecutors believe took place with the MSC Guyan shipment. Another response to increased scanning and other security measures is to use drop-offs or contaminating the containers at sea after the ship has left the port. The modus operandi usually depends on the extensive corruption among the crew, but authorities in Guayaquil, Ecuador, also report armed bands are now boarding ships and forcing crews to take loads at gunpoint. Drop-offs are now not only happening as ships set sail, but also as they pass through waters of other nations, with sources reporting the state of Falcon in Venezuela as a particular hotspot. Authorities are tackling this trafficking method using the vessel's GPS device, which gives information on the speed of the ship. If a ship suddenly slows down or stops, an alarm sounds. Traffickers, though, are already exploring new options. Anti-narcotics and port officials are talking of the switch technique, which consists of swapping drugs to cold or non-flag containers in transit. The risk is especially high in Panama, port officials explained, as drugs can be switched as they move by rail between the Pacific and Atlantic coasts. While drug traffickers may have enjoyed a head start in container smuggling, it is now an anti-narcotics priority for authorities on both sides of the Atlantic. Some in both the public and private sectors are betting on technology for solutions. Smart containers which collect and transmit data on the container's geolocation, temperature fluctuations and any other signs of tampering or electronic custom seals which send real-time information on the container movements. However, these techniques are no silver bullet. A port official in Panama who spoke on the condition of anonymity said they are prohibitively expensive and complicated to install. They can also lose signal at sea, creating a window of opportunity for traffickers to contaminate containers. More grounded solutions could be found in multinational cooperation and initiatives such as the Container Control Programme, a joint initiative of the UNODC and the World's Customs Organization. The program has increased security capacity and built international cooperation networks in both Latin America and European ports and has directly contributed to an increase in seizures as well as operations that took down important traffickers. However, despite these efforts, it is unlikely authorities will ever be able to shut down container trafficking. It is impossible to inspect even a fraction of hundreds of millions of containers that are shipped worldwide. And even if they manage to restrict it enough to make traffickers consider turning elsewhere, traffickers have no shortage of other options. Sailing vessels are becoming more accessible in price and easier to pilot, and are now dispatched between Brazil and Suriname, as well as Venezuela and the Caribbean. Private charter flights loaded with hundreds of kilograms have also been sent from Colombia and Uruguay to the UK, France and Switzerland. And the last two years have seen the first seizures in Europe of semi-submersibles built to ship cocaine. Whether it's container trafficking or not, the game of cocaine hide-and-seek has anti-narcotics authorities for now condemned to play and catch-up. The importance of containers has changed the face of trafficking in Latin America. It's turned port cities with little history of organised crime into sought-after criminal real estate, sparking struggles for domination and the strengthening of local criminal syndicates. Because of trafficking through ports, street gangs such as Panama's Calo Calo and the Baghdad have become major criminal players and the Brazil's already formidable prison gangs, above all the First Capital Command, have become large-scale traffickers whose leaders broker transnational deals. It has also given rise to a new generation of port logistics specialists who traffickers contract to organise cocaine dispatches. Such specialists operate camouflage among local elites in countries like Ecuador, the Dominican Republic and Costa Rica. The collateral damage of these new criminal dynamics has been high. Panama has seen murder rates reach record highs in recent years, fueled in no small part by gang wars for control of the ports of Panama City and Colón. In Calau, Peru's Barrio Kings campaign to establish a monopoly on trafficking through the port led not only to an inter-gang violence, but also a brutal purge of steer doors that resisted their control, and these are far from isolated examples. 
European port cities have also seen their share of violence, although on a smaller scale. Over the past two years, the two main European ports used for cocaine trafficking, Rotterdam in the Netherlands and Antwerp in Belgium, have seen gangland killings, bombings and grenade attacks connected to cocaine trade. However, violence and intimidation are clumsy tools in Europe. They attract too much attention and are bad for business. Even in Latin America, which has suffered more drug violence than any other part of the world, traffickers are beginning to realise this. Container trafficking in both Europe and the Americas relies far more on corruption than violence. Without access to corrupt port workers and officials, customs agents, police, shipping crews and others, it would be impossible. And this is a broader reflection of the cocaine trafficking world today, which increasingly favours platter, silver over plomo. July 2020, British drug trafficker Robert Dawes was sentenced to 22 years in prison for his role in one of the most emblematic European drug trafficking cases of the last decade. The attempt to smuggle almost 1.4 tonnes of cocaine on an Air France flight from Caracas to Paris. There is only one way to import 1.4 tonnes of cocaine using a commercial airline, high level and widespread corruption. In Venezuela, it has not only involved corrupt airport workers and National Guard, but also top-ranking state officials. According to a US indictment, among them were President Nicolas Maduro, along with Hugo Carvajal and Diosdado Cabello, two of the most powerful members in the current administration. In France, it involved a French trafficker turned informant, whose police handler currently stands accused of helping him use his law enforcement cooperation as a front for drug trafficking. And at the centre of it all was Dawes, a transnational polydrug trafficker with contacts in high places and corrupt port officials in his pocket all around the world, according to Robert Hickenbottom, who led the investigation by the UK National Crime Agency. The case exposed how the key to cocaine trafficking today is less the extreme violence with which the trade has become synonymous, but rather corruption, and it showed the cancerous effects of the cocaine trade, which corrupts states wherever it spreads, eroding capacity and, in more extreme cases, democracy. With trafficking to Europe booming, the cocaine trade is now spreading the cancer of corruption further and quicker than ever on before on both sides of the Atlantic. Drug traffickers have two main weapons at their disposal. Captured in Pablo Escobar's infamous offer, to those whose cooperation he sought, plumo or plato, silver or lead. Since Escobar's time, it is plumo that has been most connected to the cocaine trade. From the Medellin cartel blown up airliners to Mexican cartels hanging bodies from bridges or tossing severed heads onto dance floors. Europe has not had to endure the same levels of bloodshed as Latin America, but it too has seen extreme violence resulting from the cocaine trade. The cocaine trade is to blame for rising gun crime in Britain, according to Hickenbottom, who now heads the UK's National Firearms Targeting Centre. Our firearms cases and firearms seizures are 99% linked to the drugs trade, he said. Police sources in Spain paint a similar picture, blaming drug trade disputes for the bulk of the country's murders. Even the Netherlands, which has one of the lowest homicide rates in Europe, has seen a severed head left as a narco message and innocent bystanders gunned down in drug war disputes. A family member and lawyer of a witness in a major cocaine trafficking case were murdered. The latest discovery in July 2020 was an underworld prison with multiple cells and a torture room that was set up by a cocaine trafficking group. However, while today's drug traffickers remain more than willing to use extreme violence, they also understand that this is what led to the downfall of many of their predecessors. Violence, particularly extreme violence, creates headlines and draws attention of authorities. Instead, platter is the weapon of choice today for transnational organised crime. Corruption from drug trafficking penetrates the state at all levels, from police patrolmen to presidents, and it targets all branches of the state, the judicial, the legislative, executive and security forces. It has put justice up for sale in many Latin American countries and seen police and military not only facilitate but participate in drug trafficking and even murder. And it has placed certain governments at the service of organised crime at local and even national levels. The Air France case shines a light on perhaps the starkest example of the corrosive power of the cocaine trade corruption. When Robert Dawes was planning a major cocaine shipment in 2013, he turned to a trafficking network formed from within the state itself, the Cartel of the Suns. The Cartel of the Suns is a loose-knit network of trafficking cells embedded in the upper reaches of the Venezuelan security forces and government. The involvement of Venezuelan security forces in the cocaine trade dates as far back as the early 1990s. 
but it was the convergence of Hugo Chavez coming to power with a boom in trafficking through Venezuela to Europe that would shape the fate of the country. This was a process that did not happen overnight, but gradually it developed more the arrival of Chavez as he allowed the military to get involved in drug trafficking in exchange for its loyalty. Chavez's tolerance of cocaine trafficking secured the loyalty of the corrupt security forces leadership, a priority for the president after the 2002 attempted coup against him. It has also helped support another ally, the guerrillas of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC. Chavez supported the FARC out of the ideological sympathy and as a bulwark against the geopolitical enemies, Colombia and the United States, and the FARC were heavily involved in the cocaine trade all along the Venezuela-Colombia border. Chavez could not, or would not, contain the corruption he had permitted. The Guardia Nacional Boliviana, GNB, and other branches of Venezuela's military went from allowing trafficking to purchasing, storing, transporting and selling cocaine, which they sourced directly from the FARC. They sold weapons for drugs. It was an exchange. Many FARC weapons had the insignias of the Venezuelan Bolivarian Republic. By the time Chavez died in March 2013, the cocaine cancer had fully metastasized, eaten away at the legitimacy of the Bolivian Revolution. The cable of Chavista leaders that replaced him included numerous military and political leaders now accused of drug trafficking. Among them is not only Chavez's hand-picked successor, Nicolas Maduro, but also government ministers, regional governors and senior security and intelligence officials. It was shortly after Chavez's death when Robert Dawes dispatched his emissary to meet with a British national known as Charlie Brown, who was his upstream connection with the cartels of the Sun Network. Together, they made arrangements for the Air France shipment. Months later, on September 10th, over 30 suitcases filled with cocaine arrived at Caracas's Simon Bolivar International Airport. The suitcases were brought in for a worker's entrance to avoid scanners and baggage checks. Their stickers were counterfeit barcodes that were accepted by the Air France luggage system, despite not belonging to any travellers. Reception of the cocaine in France was then handled by one of France's biggest marijuana traffickers, the incarcerated Sofiane Hambly. However, unknown to Dawes and his Venezuelan partners, the operation was compromised. British undercover operatives in Venezuela had warned the French of the impending shipment using an Air France flight, and the French had set up a controlled handover operation. Hambly was a collaborator with a French police unit, the central office for the suppression of illicit drug trafficking. The seizure made international headlines and Venezuela came under pressure to respond. Authorities initially made 27 arrests, including airport workers, low-ranking members of the GMB, which is responsible for security at Venezuela's airports, and Ernesto Mora Carvajal, the GMB lieutenant colonel, and Hugo Carvajal's nephew, who had headed the airport security. Seven airport workers and three GMB officials later received sentences of between 10 and 22 years in prison. Maura Carvajal, however, was quickly declared innocent and released. There was little doubt that the true masterminds were to be found much higher up, and in 2020, the US Department of Justice accused President Maduro, Hugo Carvajal, and Diazdado Cabello of involvement in the case. Among the evidence were communications intercepts in which Maduro told Carvajal and Cabello shortly after the seizure that they should not have used Maikita Airport for drug trafficking and should stick to established trafficking routes. Venezuela is not the only example of a nation suffering corruption due to cocaine trafficking routes to Europe. The former Dutch colony of Suriname was long ruled by Desi Boutrès, first as a dictator and then as elected president. He allegedly had contact with Pablo Escobar and did arms for drug deals with the FARC in the 1990s. In 1999, Boutrès was convicted in absentia as the mastermind behind a shipment of cocaine to the Netherlands. It is clear that there are links between the state and the underworld in Suriname. Since then, cocaine routes to Europe have expanded around the region and so has the corruption. Ecuador, and especially the port of Guayaquil, is now one of the main dispatch points to Europe. Here, drug trafficking allegations have reached the highest level of the state. In the previous administration of Rafael Correa, there were narco scandals involving government ministers, presidential allies and even the president himself. Underworld sources in Ecuador, who spoke on the condition of anonymity, described to insight crime how police, armed forces, judges, prosecutors, public registrars, mayors, governors, even figures in the national government are all on the payroll of cocaine traffickers. If you're not corrupt, they will corrupt you, said one, who had first-hand knowledge of drug trafficking in the Colombia border region. Another major dispatch point to Europe to emerge over the last decade is the Dominican Republic, a long-time transit route to the United States. Once again, the increase in trafficking through the country has deepened already high levels of corruption. 
In the Dominican Republic, decades of corruption have made politics a partner of drug trafficking, and today this has reached exorbitant levels. Drug trafficking co-op politicians begin at the local level, where sources say candidates for municipal elections are routinely bankrolled by traffickers, and their influence rises to the national level, where President Danilo Medina has faced scrutiny over his alleged links to the wife of one of the island's most notorious cocaine traffickers, Cesar Emilio Peralta, alias El Abusador. Factions of the Dominican security forces, meanwhile, have crossed the line from corruption to criminal actors, participating in everything from murder for hire to international drug trafficking. The former director of the country's anti-narcotics police was even convicted of stealing nearly a tonne of cocaine. Today, few Latin American and Caribbean countries have escaped corruption associated with cocaine trafficking. But while such top-level corruption seems unthinkable in Europe, further twists in the Air France case show how Europe is far from immune to the cocaine cancer. The story of the seizure presented by the head of the OCTRIS, Francois Thierry, was that a corrupted luggage handler at the airport in France was supposed to get the drugs through the airport, but switched sides and told an informant of the operation. Sofiane Hambly, though, claimed in the court hearing he had organised the operation to remove the drugs from the airport from his prison cell in coordination with the police. Hambly's claims to have organised the handover are also supported by a confidential letter from Thierry to the Attorney General signed on October 28, 2015. In the letter, Thierry praises Hambly for his work, including for the seizure of 1.4 tonnes of cocaine. Hambly's cooperation with law enforcement earned him an early release from prison. However, there's evidence to suggest it may have earned him and Thierry, at the time one of France's top anti-narcotics police, a lot more. In 2016, an investigation by Liberation uncovered how Hambly and Thierry's partnership was littered with examples of suspicious behaviour. There were unauthorised operations and loads of drugs arriving and then disappearing. Customs officials noted Thierry picking up a 50 kilogram suitcase from the airport on a weekly basis for several months in 2010. Thierry claimed the suitcases were fake shipments from Bogota that he was passing through to give credibility to an informant. But prosecutors could find no records of the operations in either France or Colombia and Thierry's then girlfriend acted as Hambly's lawyer even though her expertise is not the criminal but real estate. The only certainty Sofiane H would go on to establish himself as the biggest drug trafficker in France, thanks to the protection of Francois Thierry. A year later, Thierry was indicted for criminal association. Two years after that, he was indicted again for complicity in drug trafficking. The case remained under investigation. While Thierry remains an official of the Interior Ministry, Hambly was rearrested in 2016 but then released after a two-year pre-trial detention. Like the cartels of the Suns, the story of Thierry, a top European anti-narcotics official accused of helping to traffic drugs is an extreme case, but in Europe, as in Latin America, it's still just one part of a much bigger picture. Corruption in Europe might not be as widespread as Latin America, but its core elements remain the same, structural and strategically planned. According to Europol, cocaine trafficking-related corruption is on the rise. The first European mafias to capitalise on large-scale cocaine trafficking, the Galicians and the Italian Mafia, already worked in spaces where they are able to penetrate and co-opt the state, but their participation in the cocaine trade took corruption to new levels. Armed with cocaine money, the Galicians infiltrated government institutions, the legal economy and politics at an unprecedented level. In the 1990s, the region of Galicia was in danger of becoming a Spanish Sicily. In Italy, cocaine riches have helped organised crime continue to penetrate even as anti-corruption measures have broken up old ways of working. In December 2019, Italian military police arrested more than 300 people on suspicion of membership of the Androngheta, the second biggest mafia bust in Italy's history. Suspects included politicians, lawyers, accountants, a local police chief, a former member of the Italian parliament with an ex-prime minister, Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia party. The level of infiltration and control that Adrangheta have is worrying, as going to the next level. We're talking about people who are highly educated white-collar. When organised crime from the Balkans moved into the cocaine trade, the region's already weak and corrupt institutions proved easily corrupted. Countries like Italy and Spain have more capacity to address corruption today, but similar efforts have yet to develop in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, there's less administrative control. There have been numerous cases linking Balkans politicians and police to drug trafficking, especially in Serbia. In 2009, the head of Serbian police, Ivica Dakic, faced corruption accusations after he was twice captured on camera meeting the drug lord Radulzub Radulovic. 
Dakic was never charged. He managed to survive the scandal and is now the Serbian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Nonetheless, as the Hambly case shows, in most cases the biggest threat of corruption comes at the points where cocaine enters Europe. Here, people on the ground, such as port workers or customs officials, can make the difference between success and seizure. In the port of Rotterdam, for example, several customs officers have been arrested for participating in drug trafficking including one officer who earned millions waving through contaminated containers before he was arrested and sentenced to 14 years in prison in 2017. European cocaine corridors are currently evolving and expanding. All of its 20 busiest container ports have seen cocaine seizures of over 100 kilos over the past three years. Meanwhile, cocaine routes are opening up all around Latin America, from the ports of the southern cone countries to the mouth of the Amazon River. Wherever these new routes go, the cancer of corruption follows. The future of the cocaine trade may well lie in the hands of these corruption networks. Of cocaine to Europe may have suffered, along with most illicit businesses, due to the COVID-19 crisis, but few believe the damage to the drug trade will be permanent. The pandemic has accelerated certain aspects of the evolution of the cocaine smuggling that will shape its future. What is not likely to change in the short term is the growth in the supply of cocaine to Europe as the cultivation of cocaine appears set to remain steady or indeed increase in the free producer nations of Colombia, Peru and Bolivia. In Colombia, the government of President Ivan Duque is not only struggling with the economic fallout of the COVID-19 crisis, but also an increase in violence linked to the civil conflict, now in its sixth decade, combined with social unrest. The United States, desperate to stem the explosive growth of cocaine production, is pushing Colombia to restart the aerial spraying of coca crops with glyphosate chemicals. There is resistance to this from many sectors of the Colombian society due to the damage the chemicals cause to the environment and to public health. Peru and Bolivia are in the grip of their own political crises, as the fight against drugs has fallen far down the list of government priorities, even as coca cultivation rises. Problems in the region are not restricted to the coca grown nations of the Andes. There is chaos throughout much of Latin America. Even before the pandemic, Latin America and the Caribbean were facing the challenges of sharply contracting economies, unsustainable debt and deepening inequality prompting social turmoil. All of this has lowered state resilience to organised crime and drug trafficking and allowed powerful drug trafficking organisations to penetrate key state institutions and enabling the free flow of cocaine shipments on their way to Europe. This is particularly true in two nations crucial to the flow of cocaine to Europe, Brazil and Venezuela. Brazil has been identified as the main bridge for cocaine going to Europe. Bordering each of the cocaine producer nations, Colombia, Peru and Bolivia, Brazil is in deep crisis. President Jair Bolsonaro's government is under investigation for corruption and the record levels of deforestation of the Amazon under his stewardship has soured relations with several European nations. All of this combined with growing power of the Brazilian prison gang, the First Capital Command, with its deepening involvement in the international drug trade and control of key ports, mean that there is little resistance to the flow of cocaine through Brazil. Venezuela is the principal transit nation for Colombia cocaine moving into the Caribbean and then on to Europe, as well as some illegal air traffic to West Africa. Despite international sanctions and constant US pressure, President Nicolas Maduro's grip on power appears undiminished. This failed state is not only facilitating the cocaine trade, but has also become a regional crime hub led by senior figures in the Chavista regime. Here there is zero resistance to the flow of cocaine to Europe. According to EU analysis, the availability of cocaine to consumers in Europe is likely at its all-time high and consumption rates continue to climb. While the countries with the highest consumption rates continue to be Western and Southern European nations, the EU's 2019 Drugs Market Report also reported evidence of expanding retail markets in Northern and Eastern Europe. The COVID-19 restrictions have likely hit cocaine consumption, with the reduction in social interaction. It remains to be seen if these conditions hit the cocaine trade in any permanent fashion, or if the current situation provides nothing more than a temporary disruption to drug consumption across Europe. Container shipping remains the principal way to move large cocaine shipments into Europe. While European law enforcement is very aware of the threat and dedicating increasing resources to the tracking and searching of suspect containers, the criminals continue to change their modus operandi in order to camouflage their shipments. The diversification of cocaine routes into Europe is continuing, while traffickers use in different ports to insert their cocaine into containers. Nations like Chile and Uruguay, with little history of drug trafficking, are becoming more popular with drug traffickers. 
an increase in rip-on, rip-off methods of moving drugs using unwitting companies and legal products to hide cocaine without the knowledge of the owners will continue apace, neutralising European efforts to profile suspect companies and points of departure. One senior European law enforcement official who requested anonymity as they were not authorised to speak on the matter spoke of a recent phenomenon of cloning containers. We have intelligence reports of, say, a blue container with a certain registration number being placed onto a ship in Guayaquil, Ecuador, loaded up with cocaine, then a green container with the same number is unloaded in Europe with the same cargo but no sign of drugs. It's not just departure points from Latin America that are being changed but reception points in Europe and Africa as well. With interdiction improving in the megaports of Antwerp and Rotterdam, traffickers are looking at secondary ports throughout Europe. The interconnectedness of Europe, particularly the borderless European Union, is a major advantage to traffickers and a disadvantage to interdiction efforts. As resilience to cocaine trafficking is stiffening in one nation, traffickers quickly shift to another, meaning that the overall flow to Europe is maintained. As such, greater cooperation is the only way forward, not just within the European Union, but within other nations, especially those in the Balkans, which remain outside the EU but have strong mafias involved in the cocaine trade. As cocaine seizures in containers increase, traffickers are starting to shift their methods from transporting drugs across the Atlantic. Once we hit 20% seizures, then we are reaching a tipping point where traffickers start switching methods. There are indications that criminals are now looking for different entry points and different methods. Now we are seeing different ways to stash drugs on ships. We have seen torpedoes used, which are stuck to the hull, and the discovery of a semi-submersible in Spain was a wake-up call, he added, referring to the 2019 seizure of the narco submarine, carrying three tonnes of cocaine off the coast of Galicia. There is clear evidence that more drug subs or semi-submersibles are being produced in Colombia. Colombian Admiral Hernando Matos reported that in the first eight months of 2020, 27 drug subs have been seized, 14 in Colombian waters and another 13 in international waters, along with more than 31 tonnes of cocaine that they were carrying. Not only are the drug subs in their various forms very hard to detect, they are not affected by the COVID-19 restrictions. Therefore, as the cocaine piles up in South America, the subs are some of the few vessels that can cross the Atlantic without attracting attention. Looking ahead, the use of sailing vessels and pleasure craft to move drugs will likely increase as soon as the coronavirus restrictions are lifted. Overall, however, containers will remain important for the foreseeable future. The European criminal structures still able to put together multi-tonne loads of cocaine are those with well-established routes and presence in Latin America, able to negotiate with sellers, transporters and corruption cells to keep the flow of drugs moving. The Italian Mafia and the organised crime from the former Yugoslavian countries have led the way in developing these networks. But for Kevin Mills, a retired 31-year-old veteran of Britain's National Crime Agency, Albanian criminals are now well placed and their importance in the cocaine trade to Europe is likely to grow. The Albanians have had quite a meteoric rise in the cocaine trade, operating in many parts of Europe, the UK and the Netherlands particularly. If anyone is going to have an advantage in the container trade, it's going to be the Albanians. They have a footprint in Latin America and at many exit points. They still conduct the face-to-face -face meetings by having people up here in the region. It is likely that the pandemic is pushing European drug trafficking organisations to increase their upstream presence. This will, in turn, promote the evolution of a new generation of brokers within Latin America and the Caribbean to feed the various European trafficking groups. The growing profits from cocaine are providing a steady and lucrative stream of income for European drug trafficking organisations. And it is not just the European consumer market that is strengthening criminal structures but also money that can be made from cocaine in transit to other parts of the world. In the Netherlands, for example, field research found that Dutch criminal groups charge up to €3,000 per kilo to extract cocaine shipments from the port of Rotterdam. Given that seizures at Rotterdam reached 30 tonnes in 2019, suggesting an overall annual flow of around 100 tonnes of cocaine through the port, Dutch organised crime could be earning up to €300 million Euros on cocaine going through Rotterdam alone, Almost all of that cocaine is banned for other countries. There is certainly a lot of cocaine passing through Europe on its way to other parts of the world. And Colombian underworld sources have told that Chinese and Australian markets have been aggressively developed, with the latter being especially lucrative with a kilo of cocaine worth well over $100,000. European drug trafficking organisations are also strengthening by the common practice of traffickers handling a wide portfolio of illegal narcotics and therefore engaging in drug exchanges for example, by swapping heroin for cocaine. 
This allows the European trafficking groups to maximise profits and quickly adjust to changes in consumer markets. It is not just the European criminals who are seeking to maximise profits by participating in as much of the supply and retail chains as possible. Latin American criminals, especially the Colombians, have been selling cocaine in Europe for some four decades. The Colombians have permanent presence in Spain, with up to a dozen aficionados de cobro, criminal structures that provide services to different Latin American criminal groups, like debt collection, protection of shipments, and even more money transfer services to repatriate the proceeds of drug deals. Now, there are yet more opportunities for Latin American organised crime. The rise of home deliveries and online sales, boosted by the coronavirus crisis, has spread into the drug trade, meaning that the traditional criminal control of turf to facilitate retail sales has become less important, at least for now. This means that Latin American structures based in Europe have also been able to engage in more direct sales in Europe, using not only the dark web, but also more common encrypted communication applications such as WhatsApp. It is also worth noting here that the division between Latin American and European organised crime group is itself becoming an even more artificial construct. Most of the cocaine networks operating in Europe have many different nationalities working together, making the divisions of which particular nationality controls which link in the chain harder and harder to define. Also, different criminal structures, both European and Latin American, pull shipments mean that they all share in the profits and spread the losses in case of interdiction. The days of focusing exclusively on a single drug trafficking organisation or national mafia in the hope of dismantling the cocaine trade are long gone. Due to the fact that European buyers and Latin American sellers have not been able to meet as easily face-to-face during the coronavirus restrictions, the use of encrypted technology has taken on a new significance to close cocaine deals. The importance and popularity of encrypted communications for criminals was revealed in July 2020 when European law enforcement broke the EncroChat system. Dutch police alone seized 10 tonnes of cocaine during the resulting Operation Venetic. British police revealed that an estimated 10,000 criminals in the UK alone paid £1,500 for a six-month contract for the EncroChat handsets. As mentioned above, encryption technology is also used to retail drugs in Europe although this is still a small percentage of the market. Europol has warned of growing violence in Europe linked to the cocaine trade conflicts as more actors seek a slice of an ever-growing pie. While murder rates are still relatively low, drug-related violence is becoming more common and ostentatious, such as in the case of the Dutch Taji organisation or the Montenegrin clans of Scaligari and Kavak. There have been reports of Italian organised crime figures being murdered in Germany and Balkan criminal assassinations in the Netherlands as cocaine networks settle scores. However, it's generally accepted that the use of violence is counterproductive in the long term, attracting the attention of law enforcement and forcing politicians to take action. In Latin America, proponents of extreme violence, like the Zetas in Mexico, have been the target of an extended national and international offensive that have allowed lower profile groups like the Sinaloa cartel to operate with much greater freedom. However, in Europe, some of the rising drug trafficking networks, like Albanian organised crime groups, have made use of the violence to position themselves. It does seem, however, that many Balkan mafia networks, with their reputations established, are now scaling back violence and concentrating on promoting business. The most sophisticated criminal groups, both Latin American and European, are instead increasingly turning to the application of corruption. Corruption is creeping up slowly in Western societies in a way that we have not seen before. Ten years ago, if you found a corrupt port official or customs agent, this was huge news. Now it's becoming more common. Many of the more sophisticated drug traffickers have realised that the best protection lies not in a private army and extensive security, but rather in keeping a very low profile. These traffickers, who we call the Invisibles, make Herculean efforts to remain off the radar of authorities using brokers and ensuring that they have no digital or social media footprint, as well as maintaining a solid legal facade for their business. They are indications of very smart traffickers, moving huge quantities of cocaine without attracting much attention. European police do not have the complete overview of the business, and we tend to focus on those that use violence. In Spain there are Brits, Dutch and other mobsters with no criminal records moving a lot of dope. Law enforcement is falling behind. One profile of a Colombian invisible living in Spain, who for years moved cocaine into Europe, Guillermo Acevedo, alias Memo Fantasma, is now under investigation by both Colombian and Spanish authorities as a result of recent investigations. Europe is a major money laundering centre and amongst the worst offenders are some of the most respectable countries such as the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. 
these countries have shown little appetite for serious reform, while Eastern European nations have much lower appetite for tackling the influx of drug money into the economy and into the political arenas. Brexit could further exasperate this, with the NCA saying laundering opportunities will increase as resilience lowers along with cooperation with the European Union. The panorama for cocaine trafficking to Europe is a dark one for authorities. While European and Latin governments struggle to contain COVID-19 and the economic carnage the coronavirus is leaving in its wake, organised crime sees new opportunities. Although the COVID-19 crisis has also presented challenges to transnational organised crime, the evidence suggests it is adapting quickly. If European cocaine consumption recovers quickly and new markets in Eastern Europe are further developed, Europe could rival the United States in terms of its cocaine problem. Indeed, if huge cocaine consignments controlled by European mafias transit the European Union on their way to other markets in Asia, the challenges could even surpass those faced by the United States. I hope you've enjoyed this documentary. If you did, please like, share and subscribe.